Anytime that I begin an engagement with a customer, I always try to take a pulse as to exactly where they are. Every organization is unique. Their active directory structure is unique. The way they set up their group policies is unique. Their uh, topology is unique. Are they IT centralized? Are they uh, distributed? Do they have IT boots on the ground at every one of their larger facilities? Um, exactly how do they operate? Do they have a large enough infrastructure? Well, that's kind of hard to believe anymore. Most infrastructures that manage for IT solutions has been reducing in size and scope and expected to still provide the same level of capability with fewer people running those products for their solution set. So my big thing is where does your organization stand when it comes to security versus productivity? Do you put a lot of concentrated effort in making sure that you are fully compliant, you're up to date on all your patching, you've hardened your devices, you can pass audits with flying colors, or are you more concerned with productivity where the users pretty much drive how you provide those IT solutions, where you deliver those IT services? Um, do you care about um, making sure that those users don't end up having to reboot in the middle of the day because you've deployed patches and boy, that's going to be not a good thing because they're going to complain if they get stopped being in the middle of their day needing to reboot. Or have you trained your users that as soon as patches get deployed that we're going to go ahead and implement those as soon as possible and if you need to reboot during the course of the day, that's the world we live in. We need to apply those patches. Um, where are you in the audits? Are you doing penetration testing audits? Are you doing all different kinds of audits that we have today? So where would you stand? Are you saying that you're in a balanced environment or are you leaning more on the security side where the security officer is pretty much driving the processes and policies or is the, uh, is the productivity of the organization more important than the security? And Sometimes all it takes is one event to make you turn those scales a little bit upside down from what you were used to, whereas if all of a sudden you do have a breach, now you're going to concentrate more on security. Well, this product is going to give you that situational awareness into what your environment looks like. How can you handle an audit? How are you going to be able to do data calls? If management asks you for a report showing how many of these particular devices have that particular software, or what version are they on, how long does it take you normally to put together a report like that? Does it take you minutes? Does it take you hours? Or does it take you days? How much is it going to cost to replace 33% of all of the end user hardware if you're on a three-year refresh cycle? Where are those older devices? How are you going to accomplish that feat? Um, are you going to have to have a three-month lead time and actually lose the value of that extra three months having that product out there? Are you leasing? Do you own? Is it best efforts only? All of these are, are questions that I ask during the, pre the process of doing an engagement to get customers stood up and ready to run because it's how we prioritize and what is most important to them. So BCM, client, which is, stands for BMC Client Management, I'll refer to it as Client Management and BCM from time to time. But we do cradle to grave capability, which means that you can either implement a record inside of client management at the time that you put your, your order together so you have a placeholder knowing you're going to receive those assets, or you can enter that data at the receiving dock and ScanStar, which is a RightStar product, has the capability of using your smartphone, a secure VPN Wi-Fi capability, so that you have the ability of actually writing those records directly from the receiving dock into BCM from your smartphone. You don't need any fancy dancy scanners and all this other sort of thing where you can actually put those records in. Now, you can also upload records using a CSV file. So we provide you the mapping capability so that when you receive those records and you're using a handheld scanner or you're just using, you know, a regular piece of receiving paper and you're populating a spreadsheet, you can actually upload that information into client management as again a placeholder until you actually get an agent on board. That way you could put the PO information in, the invoice information, where they were received, um, and that way then everybody has visibility as to what you have in your inventory. Once you do get an agent on board, 
um, and we'll talk about where you put an agent, what, um, where you can actually install an agent versus having to do a discovery. But if you get an agent on board, these records can automatically marry up from the time that you either use GAMSTAR to input the data or you use the CSV file. If your naming convention is such that you use, let's say, the Dell asset tag and the bar scan code that's on the box as a way of actually identifying those devices, and then you use that same naming convention for your device name, then those records will automatically merge together when you get an agent on board and you don't have to do any extra work. If your naming convention is a little different than that, and you have site IDs, you have whether it's an L for a laptop, a D for a desktop, if you have the user information in the device name, well then you're gonna to have to manually merge those records together. So therefore, the first record that you put in when you receive the item in, and the record that's created when you put an agent on board, you can simply marry those two objects together so all of that financial information actually comes along for the ride, ends up on that record with the agent on board, and now you have that cradle to grade capability. You can keep the inventory updated using either our default asset discovery scanning capability, which we use NMAP as our discovery engine, or by having an agent installed, you actually can maintain the integrity of your inventory, both hardware and software, on those endpoints. Um, we also have the ability to keep devices compliant using our patch management solution. So we partner with Avante that used to be Shablik, and we get uh, knowledge base articles downloaded into the application layer, and then we push that out to all of our endpoints, and they do a, a, a scan using that new knowledge base to identify whether or not there's any needed patches, not only in the Microsoft Windows or Office world, but also a ton of third-party applications. That way you now have awareness of what in your world needs to be patched and whether or not you choose to implement that patch on those endpoints. We also have the ability of deploying software. So for those of you that still may have Adobe Acrobat Reader 9 out there, and there are still those devices that are out there, because they were part of an image that was deployed years ago, and that box has now been sitting in the environment for five, six years, has not been refreshed, and you've had no real easy methodology to update that reader from version 9 to DC, which is the current release, which means you're really out of compliance because Adobe Reader 9 is end of life cycle. There's no longer any patching that's coming in for that particular version. So we have the capability of identifying all of the different pieces of software, whether or not it's older software that needs to be replaced or updated to a more current version that keeps you in scope and compliant. We also have the ability to run compliance rules. We have custom compliance rules and we have SCAP jobs, which you can download a SCAP application from DISA and you can actually run it against endpoint targets and within 10 minutes actually have a report as to how your device is compared against this is, um, way that they actually want to see those devices hardened, especially in the DOD space. We also integrate with um, the three large ITSM solutions that BMC offers. We integrate with Footprints, we integrate with Remedy Force, and we can integrate in with the Atrium CMDB and also the digital management aspect, which used to be called Smart IT, with Remedy. So therefore, from within the ticketing system, you have the ability of deploying software using an operational rule, which are scripts that we use. Um, you can actually run additional operational rules to clean up those devices. So when a ticket comes in, a user creates a ticket, will auto-populate that ticket with the actual information about the device that that user is logged into, and that will be part of the record. And then if that user requests, let's say, uh, uh, KeyPass or 7-Zip or Microsoft Visio or Project, depending upon the permissions, either an L1 tech or an L2 tech can actually use the ticket to deploy that piece of software to the end user, never having to open up the actual BMC client management 
console, but staying within the ITSM solution suite. Um, we also populate the Atrium CMDB for the larger Remedy products. So therefore, all of these hardware and software titles are automatically dynamically created within the CMDB and also continually updated. So when new software is added, new hardware is um, added or removed, uh, all of those records become automatically updated. Uh, we also have the CMDB for footprints and remedy force. In fact, uh, remedy force now uses uh, BMC client management as a method of populating the CMDB. If you choose to go with premium or premium plus, you can add additional functionality within remedy force so that you can do just what I said, which is deploy software, patch devices, have those compliance capabilities. We also have the ability to retire devices at the end of the life cycle. So therefore, when that device is no longer, um, it's getting ready for DRMO, or it's actually off to the shredder, or being returned someplace else, we can tag those as being deprecated, which is another term for being retired. We can then update the CMDB respectively, identifying those as now being retired devices. And therefore, we can keep that updated and have that be your source of truth. And then we can delete these records directly out of CMDB or out of um, BCM because those records are forevermore within the CMDB. And again, all of these different iterations, all of these different capabilities, every customer is different as to what they want to do. It's not a boilerplated type solution. So everything is pretty much customized to each individual user's requirements, desires, wishes. Um, so let's first talk about unmanaged devices, devices that we can discover on your network. So we have the ability of doing an asset discovery on an IP range, whether it be a full class V using Linux devices as scanners, which would I would recommend being that tool. Um, or a Windows device as a scanner running that in map engine. Um, and we can target these individual IP ranges. We can even assign a role of a scanner. So if you have a number of remote locations, we can make a device at that remote location become a scanner, run the scans from inside that LAN. So we're not running asset discovery scans across your WAN. We don't want to increase your uh, bandwidth uh, usage rates by simply putting a lot of needless effort uh, by running these large scans and then pulling them across the WAN if we can avoid it. We can, we can identify switches, printers, firewalls, uh, devices with an operating system, servers, desktops, laptops, wireless access points, um, any device that actually has an IP address. Now, the caveat to that is we have to have good credentials to be able to get into that device. The firewall rules have to be uh, set so that our scanning IP address um, is allowed to actually do a port scan on those devices. So it's not magic, it's, it's work. You have to figure out exactly what you need to do to configure it, but we make it simple enough that that work is not over labor intensive. So the level of effort or the LOE is minimally uh, there. And then once you've done these scans, that asset information is available to anybody that needs it. So therefore, we can create reports. We can send those reports to your finance team to show that these devices have been received. We can send reports to your security team to provide them with their patch level status is. We, we have the capability of distributing these reports either ad hoc or on a regularly assigned schedule. So therefore, we don't have to come back and continue to have to babysit the product on a regular basis. So this is what is known as agentless inventory. On the switches, as long as the ACLs are set so that our switch has the ability to go in on the management VLAN and be able to interrogate that with a read-only SNMP string, then we can actually do switch port mapping, which means we can take a look at a user's device look at the connectivity inventory, and identify exactly what port on what switch that device is plugged into, which eliminates the need for tracing back um, exactly where that device is connected on what port. We can do this seamlessly through the product. Then we have 
the managed capability where we actually have an agent on board. This gives us our biggest bang for the buck. We have the ability to put agents on uh, uh, servers, desktops, laptops, mobile devices such that are currently running iOS, such as iPads and iPhones. We currently do not have the capability of fully managing Android devices, and Microsoft's getting out of the Windows Phone business, so that no longer will be uh, a situation. But um, so we do have that functionality, and our MDM solution works a lot like WatchGuard or any of the other products that are out there where we can configure it, we can set it up so that it automatically connects to your Wi-Fi, we can actually push software down to it. Um, we, we have complete visibility over what's on that box and who actually is logging into it and what they have the capability of doing, including configuring uh, you know, your Office 365 solutions. So what do we do? Well, we can put an agent on a Windows operating system, we can put an agent on a Linux operating system, and we can put an agent on a Mac OS X operating system. Not an iPad, not an iPhone, but um, a regular laptop from, from Mac, uh, we have the ability of installing an agent. So with that, what can, we, what can we actually collect? Well, we can collect all kinds of inventory, and we'll go over that in more detail. We have patch management, we can deploy software, we can remote control the device, we can actually have direct access to the device, which means we can actually go in and do a reg edit once again, um, where before remote registry editor was no longer available to us, now it's back into our capabilities. Um, we, we can do Windows operating system deployment, we can create gold images, we can actually synchronize that image to remote physical locations, and be able to image devices at those remote sites using the same approved gold image, and it becomes a very simplistic approach to managing your operating system deployment. And we have the compliance management. We're gonna get into a little bit more detail on some of these. We also have the availability, capability, and we have had for quite some time, the ability to manage devices over the internet. So as long as we have an agent on board, we can't install an agent over the internet, uh, but if we install an agent while it's sitting within our control, then we have the ability once that, let's say laptop, leaves the WAN, goes home, and I call it Starbucks mode, um, it will then communicate to a device in the DMZ. We have what we call a DMZ relay, and then that relay can then communicate to our master application server and that can be managed through any device that a user has the ability of logging into the console. So I can remote control that device. I can directly access the file system on that device um, without any interaction from the user whatsoever. It's not a meet in the middle, you know, prearranged, everybody go to this particular URL and approve this and now we're good to go. Um, this is truly just like the device is sitting on your WAN uh, local LAN, it is out on the internet and we have the ability of also updating the inventory. So the time when you would lose sight of where those devices were last are gone because as long as that device has the capability of reporting into that DMZ relay, we know exactly where that device is and who logged on and when it was last seen. So I know not every user in the world is a bad guy, but we do have some that may report a device stolen or lost when in fact they're logging into it day after day after day and we have visibility of that. Um, so how do we help secure the infrastructure? How do we do this? So we have, like I, I'm gonna re go over this again. We have patch management. We do both Microsoft patches for uh, Windows updates and also the, the regular Microsoft patching solution. We also do a bevy of third party patching. We do the software deployment where we can update or push out new titles to users. We can do the compliance inventory. We have the ability to group devices without relying upon Active Directory. So we don't need to use an already created group in AD, we can create our own group. So if you're doing patching, you could create a phase one group, a phase two group, a phase three group. So you have your IT guinea pigs in phase one, deploy your patches, nobody yells, great go to your phase two group, 
Um, actually, these would be representative users from each of the software builds. That would be great. Um, and then your large phase three would be everybody else in production. Um, provide visibility to various interested parties, which means that we can provide very granular permissions so they can come into the console and just see what they're allowed to see, no more, no less. So if you want to eliminate your top level executives from your L1 group, you very easily you can do that. So they don't have the capability of managing those endpoints. Or if HR and finance are hands off and only the L3 people can actually manage those devices because of the kind of data that is usually on those endpoints, um, you have the very easy capability of doing that. Again, we can provide automated reports for change requests. We can show you what a device is going to be patched, what patches will be deployed to those. Go to the change board, actually show the changes that are going to be done on each and every device. And then we can show a report after the patching is done to show that all of those devices have already received their patches and now they're compliant, or identify those devices that may have been offline or have not reported in since the patch was released and uh, we're still waiting for that device to get turned back on. And we are able to apply all of the above, even if the devices are not sitting on the WAN or over a VPN connection using our internet capability or Starbucks mode. So let's talk about patching. Um, patching, <laughs> it's real easy to create a maintenance window for your servers because they're always on, they're always available, and you can schedule those to be run at 2 a.m. in the morning for a 30 or 40 or a 60 minute window, and then have those devices reboot, come back on in a particular order so that your backend servers are patched and rebooted first, your application servers are then patched and rebooted so they can tie back into your, app or your database servers, and then your member servers and all your other ones can be patched when those two um, groups are completed, such as your Active Directory, domain controllers, uh, your catalog servers, those should be staggered, obviously. But the biggest problem that we have in the uh, customer's face is laptops. How do we patch laptops? Well, because laptops can be turned off, the lid, uh, they power cycle, they go to sleep, they get turned off, they're in a backpack, they're in a car. How do we do that? Well, because of the fact that we can pre-deploy these patches so that, um, let's say that you patch once a month, you have the ability of deploying the patches to the endpoint so they're resident on that device long before the actual maintenance window occurs. They're sitting at home at 10 o'clock at night, they're turned on, and lo and behold, they actually get patched because that's when their maintenance window is, and they don't have to go fetch any of those patches. They're already on um, the device locally and is running a local schedule at that point. If the device doesn't come back on until the next morning and shows back up and turns on, then they can get patched when the user shows back up Monday morning. Doesn't have to, that's just an option. So we have multiple ways of actually managing those laptop problem children, if you would, in our, in our ability to do our patching. Um, we have two major types of patch deployment. We have the WSUS type where we can actually assign a particular patch to a particular group, tell us exactly when it's going to happen. There is a larger level of effort for that because each month you must go in and actually select the patches that you want deployed, test them in the phase testing, and then activate those for a particular time to go off. Um, our patch jobs are the set it and forget it variety where an admin can go in go through the wizard, set it up for the criticality, whether it's critical, important, select those, whether these are security patches or non-security patches, and for what product family do you actually want to apply these for? And then every, every month, this will actually apply. If you have it set for a daily schedule, it would run daily, weekly, weekly. Whatever you set the schedule for, and you never have to come back here again and do any touching. So the desktop administration folks love the patch job solution. Some of the servers will get applied to patch jobs for the lower end. Um, don't have to worry about those servers as much. Uh, the ones that we need to handhold, 
the exchange servers, the large database servers, maybe our domain controllers, we can still use the patch deployment where it's a hands-on making sure everything works before we say job well done. Uh, we also have the ability to patch Mac devices, OS X. We have an operational rule that will actually can be assigned to a Mac and we run every two weeks or however frequently you want it to run. It will actually go out to the App Store and you can set it up to a specific patch or you can select the recommended. And if you set the recommended, again, this becomes a set it and forget it. Now you know that your Mac users are no longer needing to do that update themselves by looking at the little icon on the bottom of their tray there and say, oh, there's a one, there's a two, there's a three. I better go and find, figure out what I need to do. You can force that so it does it automatically through this tool. We can also patch Linux boxes by using an op rule, such as a yum update dash y, and that will just simply force those those devices to go out and update. Again, this is the a little scarier way of doing it. Uh, you can be much more specific, but we do have the ability to run these command lines from Linux boxes so that you don't have to log on to each Linux box and, and run it yourself. So now it's time to do a patch demo, and I might have just missed it, so we'll see. Uh, let's see here. So I have got this device that I'm going to remote control into. And this was assigned, so I'm going to go ahead and log in. So this is our remote control feature. You can see that now in the later versions, we have the ability of actually identifying who's remoting in, should you choose to use that. And so, okay, very good. So I have already patched this, so I missed it by several minutes. Um, but you can see this is the actual reboot required. I have nine minutes and 49 seconds before it will automatically do this. I've got this configured so that I can cancel the reboot should I want to. I can reboot it now or I can minimize it. And so I can actually extend the timer if you notice I have nine minutes there, I'm gonna click OK. Now I have 24 minutes, I'm gonna click OK. Now I have 39 minutes. And there is a, a point where it won't extend any longer. So there's a drop dead time there. Um, so you can see that I can actually forestall that reboot predicated upon what the conditions are that I set within the, app, the job itself. I can actually go in there and actually, uh, I'm gonna cancel the reboot for right now. So now that is canceled. I'm going to go back into the console and take a look at this device. And <clears throat> if I go into the actual patch management job itself, I'm going to say, no, I don't want to disconnect. So this is what I actually applied, this patch. So I put in the Adobe Air installer and uh, that's the device. It's an unrated patch. So for the purposes of this demo, I wanted to make sure that we actually had that. I can take a look at the actual device itself and refresh. You can see that it's no longer activated, but I can have such granular control that I can actually look at the log file of this device of all of the patches that it's had. So here we go. Um, starting patch group execution. So I actually uh, initiated it. The device downloaded and installed the Adobe Air installer. It was received. It was starting the patch at 2.20, and it was starting the process, and it actually completed within a minute or so. And then the managed reboot, the window that you saw, actually was displayed. So the patch management module is now suspended until the next reboot, which means that because I had a force reboot on that, Adobe Air by itself was not going to force that device to reboot. But I'm going to go ahead and actually reboot that device now that I've shown you the log. Uh, before I do that, I want to give you a quick taste of uh, the direct access. There's the file system. 
I'm actually in the file system of this device right now, which is sitting in the Right Star Lab in Virginia. And I can go into program files. I can go directly into BMC software, client manager, keep navigating down. I can go into the data folder. I can go into the patch management premium folder. And I can take a look at the patches. All of this information is associated to this device. And here is all of that information on this box should I want to know anything more about it. So I have direct access and capability. Now, what if I wanted to go into, somebody created a new folder, might have been me. What if I wanted to do a file transfer and I wanted to move that key pass portable over to my local system? I could very easily do that by clicking on that, highlighting it, moving it over, and now using secure FTP, oh, maybe not. <clears throat> Don't know why that failed, but maybe it didn't like that whole folder. Almost done. There we go. So you can. I, I don't know. Never tried that, so I don't know why that didn't. Why that didn't like it. Oh, too many. Too much stuff. Um, but you do have the. Let's just do this so you get an idea. Move it over. Not sure why that didn't like it. Typically, I don't ever have an issue with that. So that's the file system. Then I also, I talked to you about registry. So if I go to H key local machine, software, um, Numara software, Numara asset management platform, client, this is the actual registry value on that device. And as you can see, I can create keys. I can create binary values. I can actually delete or modify any of these values and it would take place right away. Um, I can also take a look at all of the services that are actually running on that box. So I'm pulling them into my console right now. Well, for it, I've just looked at the time, so I don't wanna um, overdo that. Um, I want to show you the process management, and then I'll get back to the device and reboot it. <coughs> so um, if you remember, there was no uh, <clears throat> command window running on that device, but I'm going to go ahead and pop one open. So let's say that I need uh, administrator level. So now all of a sudden, I have a command window on this device so that I can this user that's logged in is a non-privileged user, but I want to make sure that I have the ability of running a piece of software or running a, uh, a script or something with elevated capability. This is how I can do it on that endpoint. Again, reducing my, my L1 support to the point where I may be, uh, you know, as soon as I get the ticket, I can close it, first call resolution type of thing. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and reboot the box so I can do it this way. Uh, yeah, no, I don't want this connect. Right here, go to direct access tools, and I just simply want to reboot. It's going to ask me on my shirt, yes. So <clears throat> this window here would stay logged in, attempting to restart the service. So now my remote control is gone because the device is actually rebooting. And this window would stay open if I wanted it to, to show me when the box was back up and running. And then I can remote control or direct access it once again. But I don't have time to do that, so I'm just going to do this. And then I'm going to go ahead and go back to the demo. <clears throat> okay. Um, another big problem is keeping software titles up to date. We know that's a problem. Patching by itself does not actually update versions. So Adobe Acrobat Reader 9 through a patch will not move to 10 or 11 or DC. You have to actually deploy that particular piece of software. A lot of software titles are version specific. So therefore, patching will only patch the version that it's on. It will not update to the latest and greatest version of that software title. Now, when we talk about Google Chrome, Firefox, these all have a big number one in front of their version numbers. So even though it looks like we're doing version increments, we're really not. 
we're actually just updating from within that major version. And again, we can quickly group all of the devices that you want to manage, whether it be in uh, software, all the, show me all the devices that have reader on it but are not running reader DC. And I can make these non-compliant devices and then I can actually assign that software package to that non-compliant group. And then even if a device shows up after the fact, let's say that an old image gets deployed, it's running uh, reader 11, um, it will check in, do an inventory, it will get put into this non-compliant group, and then that software will be updated without me having to do anything about it. All right, let's quickly do a software demo. I'm running out of time in a hurry. <clears throat> so I'm going to show you a wizard. And this is how we do packages. So I have a packager here. This is going to be an MSI package. And I'm going to go to select the package itself. It's on my downloaded software. It's inside of here. And I'm going to park it inside of my utilities folder. So I'm just going to be installing PuTTY. All right. I'm going to, I don't need any of these additional files or anything. So my user interface, I'm going to go ahead and uh, make it reduced, or actually basic progress only. And it's going to be an install versus a patch, repair, publish, or uninstall. I don't need to add any additional. I can actually delete the underlying source file by clicking that box. Hit Next. I'm going to go ahead and publish that to the master. I want to create an additional operational rule. That operational rule will take on the name of the package itself. I'm going to park this in my folder, and then there should be a software deployment, and then there should be a utilities folder. There is. And I'm going to hit Next. Now I can add additional steps. So under Inventory Management, I want to update my software inventory so that it will be updated as soon as I get done installing this. And that's really all I need. And then I'm going to hit Next and Finish. Sure, I'll go to the Distribution. Actually, yes, I'll go to Distribution. And I'm going to assign it to a device, <clears throat> and it's going to be install, or I can publish. I'm just going ahead and publish that. Now I'm going to look for my device that I want to do this to. And this is the laptop that I'm currently on right now. And I'm going to hit finish. Yes, I want to go to the package. <clears throat> so it's in the process of actually getting ready to um, do its thing. Now notice that this is under packages itself, and I want to be under operational rules. I want to go to the R Right Star Lab. I want to go to software deployment under utilities. And here is my putty. And I'm going to make some changes. I'm going to say install. I think it's that way. And I'm going to actually assign a icon to this. This should be in my downloads folder. There it is. And there's the little icon for putty. So now I'm going to click OK. Then I'm going to come back. So you can see where this says published. So I'm going to right click down here. Open up My Apps, which is a methodology of providing users the ability to decide when or if they want to install particular pieces of software. So here you can see where the icon now has been associated. The name's a little squirrely, and the notes didn't come across because I just modified those. So let me come back over here and let me republish. Now that I made the addendum and give it a moment. 
and I've got, uh, let's see, it's 247. I'm going to kick this off. Let's see, I think it's still. Where was it? Here, let's refresh, see if it's updated. There it is, install putty. I'm just going to click install. So now it's going to begin the downloading process. All right. So that's software deployment. I showed you patch software deployment. Last is going to be the, uh, let's pop this open. So audit time, audit checklist, um, compliance. Everybody, I don't know how many of you have actually had to suffer the slings and arrows of getting an audit. I don't know how long an auditor has been on your location actually collecting and gathering data. And, I mean, do you absolutely know for certain what they're going to find when they show up? Are you 100% confident you know what's out there? Will they find anything that potentially would, could be harmful to, you know, your career because they found things that you thought were being done, but they weren't being applied to every endpoint, and they just happened to find two out of 20 where group policy inheritance might not have been passing through, so the configuration settings weren't getting through to two of the devices in their sampling group. So what are the different types of audits? There's PCI audit, HIPAA audit, compliance, CIS, OX, Sorbanes-Oxley, uh, internal, a software audit from a particular manufacturer, financial, external. There's a whole bunch of stuff. Okay, so here's my putty coming on board right now. And remember I told you I wanted to make it just basic. So we saw it get installed. It's done. No user interaction whatsoever. And now I'm going to be updating my software inventory so that I will have a record of that. So let's just come back here and let's talk about what that means. So under my device, uh, this is my inventory. I have a compliance section here. So you could see where um, all, here's PuTTY. See where PuTTY's not installed? So I can click on that and identify exactly why it may not be installed. I'm looking for putty and add remove programs, and it's not there. Well, I'm just now finished installing it. It's going to go out there and do a full software inventory and then update that inventory. And then once that inventory is complete and this has a chance to reevaluate, it will have a check mark then knowing that putty has been installed and because of my role, I need PuTTY, so now I can be compliant and having PuTTY on board. So um, again, compliance is kind of a two-edged sword where we have the ability to do both custom compliance and SCAP compliance. So we have dashboards that we can use. And in the RS lab, I've already created this, which is the Right Star Lab. So do I, are my Windows 7 devices, am I missing any critical patches? No. Is all of my AV current on all of my endpoints? Yes. Um, Uh-oh, I did not pass the USGCV uh, SCAP job. Um, I'm missing a service pack. Oh my gosh, what am I missing? So I can double click into that graph and I can identify exactly what service packs I'm actually missing. So I can double click on it and I can hit the magnifying glass here, and I'm running Windows 10 1803. I do not have 1809 installed. So therefore, by virtue of what the rule is, my box is not 100% up to date. But again, I can quickly identify and find those elements that are missing that capability. The other thing, aside from custom compliance, where I can create whatever I want, I also have the ability of importing um, SCAP jobs. Um, oh, by the way, on my patch reporting, this is what I could have provided to my change control board, which is showing what device, this is Gibbs 03, and then what patch is going to be applied during my change management board. And then at the end, I can show that that was actually applied. Um, let's see. Uh, this is a PDF of the same report, so we can make it in a web version or a PDF. PDFs are portable, makes it a little bit easier. Um, under SCAP, here are all of the, from DISA, these are all of the different SCAPs that you can download and make it a part of your environment. Uh, let's see, I'm missing one. Where is it? 
community. So I ran a Windows 10 SCAP job, and here are the results for all of my failed. So if you are in charge of security and you want to know, okay, uh, let's see, uh, the Windows installer always installs with elevated privileges must be disabled. Oh, okay, so for me to be compliant, I need to figure out what I need to do. So under the fix text, it says configure the policy value, administrative templates, Windows components, Windows installer, always install with elevated privileges to disabled. So now I know how to create a GPO that will actually satisfy that requirement and get me further along the road of hardening my devices without having to do tons and tons of research and figuring that out. It makes your life simpler. Trust me, it makes it simpler. Okay, uh, let's get back to this. So I just kind of quickly ran through the compliance piece. What kind of data do we actually collect under inventory? We do software inventory, which also comes along with application management, software license management. If you buy compliance, you'll also get a product catalog to normalize your software titles. We do security and security products. Security product comes along with compliance also. Custom inventory, I'll show you that in just a sec. Power settings, patches and service packs. We also keep 30 days worth of historical changes on each device that has an agent. So if you want to go back and take a look to see what was deleted during the last patch installation, we can show you exactly what was changed on that device down to the executable. Um, BMC Client Management makes it extremely easy to retrieve the data. We have tons and tons of out-of-the-box reports, operational rules, device groups, queries, so you don't have to be an expert. You get started right away. No need to know SQL whatsoever. Uh, implementation and training takes weeks to make somebody really proficient in a full production environment versus months to actually be comfortable to put this into a production environment. Um, I'm going to show you that piece right now, and then we'll break for Q&A. And I'm almost done, folks, so hang in there with me. So what can we do on a reporting standpoint? So <clears throat> on this device right here, well, let's do this device. Under inventory, and wait for it to load up. And then under patch, I can actually click on history. And now here we go. Uh, I, sh I just installed that Adobe Air installer, and now it's showing me that it's actually installed. And this was actually removed. So I had to remove this one to get this one in place. So that's telling me that. Now I can look at a complete history. I can look at all of my deleted objects. So you can see this is what was actually pulled off of those devices. Um, what did I actually add brand new? All of this stuff from a patching standpoint was added brand new. Again, this is out of the box functionality, 30 days worth of history. If we go to um, software, and I click on history. We can come in here and look at all of the different software that was actually updated or added that scan uh, that we scanned. Then I can take a look at all of this information and know what changes have taken place. Great for troubleshooting. What went wrong? Why did it stop working? What changes took place? So it gives me all of that functionality. Also, if I'm monitoring applications, I can actually look for all of the monitored apps on this particular device, I was only monitoring Notepad. So therefore, I can go back and see exactly how long in the duration column was Notepad run for on this device. Well, let's get a little bit more practical. Let's come to my laptop, and not a demo machine, and let's take a look at monitored applications. And this is today's date. So I've got Java Web Start, Adobe Reader, all versions, and how long did I actually have Reader open, Microsoft Word. I can watch all of this information. So if I've got premium software titles and I want to make sure that Joe Blow is actually running it before I take it away from his machine, I can do that and reassign that to somebody else that's just requested it instead of go out and buy a new license. What if um, from an inventory, what if I wanted to take, a, this is all default information that we pull out of here. So if I want to go to operating system, 
I can actually see when this device was actually last rebooted. So on this Gibzo 3, now this shows, um, that's the installation date, last reboot today. So that was the last boot time because remember, I applied the patch and I rebooted it. So now I can, I can write queries and reports showing me all devices that haven't rebooted in the last week or so. All right, I'm going to stop there because it's becoming close to the bewitching hour. So, Dick, do you want to go ahead and go do the Q&A thing? Sure. <clears throat>